Chapter Number Eighteen of the Friendship of Anne, a story by Ellen Douglas Deland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of course, Sydney was willing. She did not love a quarrel any more than Dorothy did, and now that matters were explained, and she felt so sure of the friendship of all the girls whom she liked she knew she ought to be generous to bertha she was fully aware that her own conduct had not been altogether irreproachable in the beginning she had never liked bertha and had often showed her dislike plainly she told dolly now that perhaps it was for this reason that bertha had behaved so cruelly to her for it seemed cruel to her and to dolly also they talked it all over, and this conversation was the beginning of a friendship between them, which lasted without the slightest shadow upon it all their lives, and which the years only served to make closer. It is thus that good so often springs from what seems to be evil. They returned to the school, and Dolly sought out Aunt Talbot. Have you sent any notices yet? She had found Anne in her own room. No, replied Anne, who appeared looking for something in her trunk, and whose voice came from its depths as she bent over it. Well, I want you to promise me something, continued Dolly. You needn't ask me to promise not to send them, for I shouldn't be so silly as to make any such promise as that. Those notices have got to go, and go they shall. I am going to take them to the post office myself before supper. I am looking now for that wretched bangle. She had straightened herself to deliver this speech, and now she returned to the search. What bangle? asked Dorothy, although she knew perfectly well. That bangle Bertha Macy sent me at Christmas. It is nothing but imitation. I saw that right away when it came, only I wasn't going to tell the family I thought so. Bud discovered it, I know, but Fred Merriman was so prejudiced against Bertha already, I thought I wouldn't give him any further satisfaction. Oh, here it is at last. The idea of putting it in one of Tiffany's boxes. It came from some cheap Sixth Avenue store, like her own. I shouldn't have minded so much if she had sent it in a brown paper parcel, but to try to palm it off as coming from Tiffany's. Oh, it is too much to bear. Oh, Anne, don't be silly. What difference does it make? What are you going to do with it now? Send it back to her. Anne! of course why not you shan't do any such thing indeed i shall do you suppose i am going to keep it you needn't keep it if you don't want to throw it away if you like but don't send it back why not because you are a gentlewoman and gentlewomen don't do such things that is why anne was silent she stood by her trunk looking at the bracelet. Dolly pursued her slight advantage. Do you think your mother would let you send it back? Still Anne was silent. Please promise me one thing, said Dolly. Don't send anything, the notice or the bracelet, until tomorrow. That's two things, said Anne. Then she looked at Dolly and the corners of her mouth twitched. Presently a dimple began to make its appearance. In another minute she was laughing. She threw her arms around Dolly's neck and gave her a hug that was almost bear-like. "'You little goose,' she said. "'You wretched creature, always trying to mend broken bones. In other words, make up quarrels and fights. You needn't think I—' am going to give in in any way no indeed 
I will oblige you by waiting until tomorrow, but tomorrow the notices and the bracelet go. But Anne had laughed, and Dolly felt that there were reasonable grounds for hope. But the peacemaker had not finished her day's work. Meeting Miss Abby in the hall soon after her conversation with Anne, she asked her if she might speak to her in private. Miss Abby consented at once and led the way to the study. This was a small office-like room which was regarded by the pupils in very much the same way that a courtroom is thought of by a prisoner. Here justice was dispensed, punishments meted out, and scoldings administered. It was the apartment, in fact, where anything that was in the least disagreeable always took place. It was impossible for any pupil, no matter how innocent her conduct nor how irreproachable her standing, to enter the study without feeling a thrill of apprehension. In the minds of the Wickersham girls, it was always spelt with a capital S. To be sure, if Miss Wickersham herself were not seated in the chair of justice, the ordeal was not apt to be quite so formidable. But even with the milder-mannered Miss Abby, it could cause dismay. There was something about the little barely furnished room, with its office desk, its bench for the culprit, and its swinging chair, in which sat the presiding judge, which, as Anne Talbot expressed it, made you feel a sympathy for the victims of the Spanish Inquisition, which nothing else could accomplish. You were going to be morally drawn and quartered when you entered that room. So Dolly, being motioned to the bench by Miss Abby, felt her knees shaking under her in spite of the righteousness of her cause. And Miss Abby, who had closed the door with the clang which brought to mind the famous couplet, Leave hope behind all ye who enter here, became at once convinced that Dorothy Fearling was guilty of something, and no doubt she had come to confess it. It was somewhat surprising, therefore, to Miss Abby, when Dolly, with a courage that astonished even herself, suddenly opened the subject, not with a confession, but with a question. "'Miss Abby,' she said, "'will you please tell me if you heard the noise yourself that we were making last night, or if one of the girls told you that we were having a party. Miss Abby surveyed her for a moment in silence. She was a lady of mature years and extremely dignified bearing. She was so stout that according to all the laws of nature she should have been jolly, but she was not. She wore spectacles, and a dark brown pompadour surmounted her large forehead. She had no sense of humor, but she had a kind heart. Miss Abby, in her own proper character, would seldom be, have been severe, but she passed through life as Miss Wickersham's sister, and she never allowed herself to forget that she must adapt herself to the part and live up to the position. The girls feared Miss Emma Wickersham, liked Miss Abby, and loved Miss Jeanie. I don't know precisely why I should answer such a question, said Miss Abby, after the slight pause, during which she had considered how her sister Emma would have made reply. Well, of course, there is no real reason for you to answer, said Dolly, whose courage was rapidly increasing. She was so thoroughly in earnest that she forgot to be afraid. But I do wish you would tell me, Miss Abby, for a lot depends on it. Perhaps it would be advisable for you to explain more fully, Miss Fearing. What difference can it make? You were all engaged in wrongdoing and were discovered. Miss Wickersham has 
administered her rebuke and decided on the form of your punishment it is not necessary for us to discuss the matter any further yes it is miss abby indeed it is it makes all the difference in the world there are fusses and fights going on and things are in a regular mess miss fearing such language is more suited to one of the boys at pratt academy than to a young lady at the wickersham school oh i know miss abby but you must excuse me i've got so much on my mind i'm trying to straighten things out and haven't got much time to do it in couldn't you just tell me yes or no if i ask you whether bertha and julia told you couldn't you dear miss abby dorothy had a sweet voice and her pleading tones went straight to the heart of miss abby after all there was really no reason why she should not gratify her surely emma could not object but she would not act too hastily it seemed an excellent opportunity to procure information in regard to a matter which had long since reached the ears of the sisters but of which they had learned no precise details miss abby was one who took a great interest in small matters she loved to discover things partly for the pleasure of doing so and partly because she felt it added to her importance in the eyes of sister emma they knew that a secret society existed in the school but just what it was they had never been able to find out miss wickersham disapproved on principle to secret societies no matter what the object but the girls had been so cautious in the management of this one that although this was the second year of its existence the teachers knew very little about its rules and regulations so here was miss abby's chance was your party last night merely a friendly gathering or was it the meeting of your club she asked and dolly taken unawares and forgetting the need for caution answered it was a club meeting you have them every week i believe almost every week and your object to keep quiet and do good and have fun and oh i ought not to be telling why not because it is all secret and will never forgive me it is a secret society then and miss talbot is at the head of it dolly was silent unless you can give me the particulars i am asking for you cannot expect me to give you the information you desire miss fearing oh miss abby aren't you going to tell me please miss abby without making me tell but miss abby pleased with what she considered her profound astuteness determined to be firm all of dorothy's earnestness and pleading failed to move her here was her opportunity and she would make the most of it tell me all you can about your secret society and i will tell you what you wish to know she repeated dolly felt very much distressed it did not seem to her quite fair on miss abby's part to insist on telling her what was really the secret of many others besides dolly but on the other hand perhaps the teachers had a right to demand information as to what went on in their school and also it seemed to dolly very important to know whether bertha and julia had told do all the girls in the school belong they all had a chance to some have gone out why did they go out oh they were dropped for one reason or another there were rules of course and they broke the rules then it is really what might be called a clique that is precisely what we wholly disapprove of in the school miss fearling 
Miss Wickersham has always desired that there should be nothing of that sort. Nothing can come out of it but ill feeling and trouble. Dolly was inclined to agree with her, though she did not say so. Certainly there had been much ill feeling and trouble, although it had not arisen altogether in the club. Since you have told me this much, said Miss Abby magnanimously, I will fulfill my promise and say that I did not hear from Miss Macy or Miss Clark that you were breaking the rules of the school last night and holding a gathering after nine o'clock. You made so much disturbance that you could be heard very distinctly when I passed over the stairs. I am very glad to know that Miss Macy and Miss Clark would have nothing whatsoever to do with the party, as I am fear to be the case, since you asked me whether they told of it. You may go now, Miss Fearing. It is time to make ready for supper. Dorothy departed, feeling that her errand had not been altogether a success. After supper she asked Bertha and Julia if she might have a conversation with them, and they went to their room, having procured permission to absent themselves from the usual evening games. This part of her task was what Dolly liked the least. It would have been far easier to let the whole thing go and make no effort to bring about a reconciliation. She did not admire nor care for Bertha or Julia, and she felt that they were no addition to the club. Only her intense love of peace kept her to her resolution. If anything in the world could be done to restore peace, she must do it. Bertha, she began, as soon as the door was closed, I hope you don't mind what I am going to say. Bertha's condition of mind during the past few days had not been happy. She found that she had forfeited by her conduct the good opinion of all the girls whom she had most wished to have for her friends. She hated her present position, but she had fully determined never to yield, for she told herself again and again that she was in the right. She answered Dolly rather shortly. It depends upon what you say. I suppose it does, but I mean it in the most friendly way, Bertha. It was impossible to doubt Dolly's sincerity. She had a simple, straightforward way of speaking that was convincing and her face was so sweet, her hazel eyes so true. Well, what is it? If you would only say something right away to the club committee and to Sydney, say that you are sorry, I mean, I think, it would all come right. If you mean apologize, you needn't say another word. You needn't think I shall ever do that. Well, perhaps not regularly apologize, but you could show in some way that you didn't mean to be so cruel to Sydney. Cruel? Yes, I think it was cruel. But we heard it, put in Julia, who had been an eager listener, but who as yet had said nothing. How did we know it wasn't true? I told Bertha the story of the Stuarts just exactly as I heard it from my aunt. It doesn't seem worth while to tell a bad story, said Dolly. Why not let it be forgotten? Oh, no, protested Julia. I think these things ought to be known about people. I have heard my aunt say that very thing. She always says the worst ought to be known, and people judged accordingly. Then I don't agree with your aunt, said Dolly, with more vehemence than was usual with her. I think the worst had better be forgotten and the best remembered, for very often the bad isn't true. It wasn't this time. If your aunt hadn't remembered the worst and told it, the dreadful story about the Stuarts 
would never have been known here and it is not true at all but it isn't worth while to talk any more about that i just wanted to tell you bertha that sydney is perfectly willing to be friends again if you are and what about anne asked bertha well of course anne feels very indignant but she paused not knowing exactly how to continue it was perfectly outrageous of her to accuse us of telling miss abby last night you see miss abby came just after you were there so of course it was natural to suppose you had met her and perhaps told her do you think we told her no i never thought so and this afternoon i saw miss abby and asked her and she said you had not at this moment bertha's self-control gave way and she began to cry to both julia and dorothy this was a complete surprise oh it is so dreadful sobbed bertha to be accused of what isn't true dolly hesitated but only for an instant then she said very quietly then perhaps you can understand bertha how bad sydney has felt she was accused you know of writing those letters bertha did not reply but dorothy felt convinced that this last remark of hers had made an impression although perhaps it was but slight it is impossible to say what would have resulted from this conversation had it been continued perhaps bertha's heart would have become softened and the secret committee would have yielded and perhaps the two girls would have been permitted to retain their membership in the kqc but the matter was destined to be settled in another way even while they were talking there came a knock upon the bedroom door julia opened it miss jenny was standing in the hall young ladies please come down to the dining room at once miss wickersham has something important to speak to you about she said bertha hastily dried her eyes and the three went down they supposed at first that they were the only ones summoned to the conference but they found when they reached the dining room that every member of the school was present each girl sitting in her accustomed place at table but with her chair turned towards miss wickersham who stood by the door which led to the kitchen at one end of the large room are we going to have an extra meal whispered the incorrigible anne to her neighbor i certainly didn't have half enough supper then ensued a pause of breathless suspense all eyes were fastened upon miss wickersham something was coming what was it never before had the school been summoned to an evening conference in the dining-room not within the memory of the oldest inhabitant has such an event taken place what was it and then the bolt fell young ladies said miss wickersham and never had her manner been quite so icy i have been confirmed in the suspicions which i have long entertained i find to my surprise and displeasure that a secret society exists in this school i do not know its name its object or its membership but i do know that i heartily disapprove of anything of the kind to me there is nothing more odious than a community divided into sets this school is a community we must live together on equal terms so as far as possible i feel indeed i am sure that the existence of this society may account for much trouble that i have been perfectly aware of for some time but have been unable to cope with therefore young ladies from this moment your society is disbanded 
you will hold no more meetings nor will you take any action connected with it and you understand i hope that this is final whoever disobeys me will be suspended from school for a shorter or a longer time as may seem proper to me oh miss wickersham cried anne springing to her feet you haven't heard right the k q c is a splendid thing we do lots of good we miss talbot i did not ask your opinion no i know you didn't but oh miss wickersham not another word if you please it is quite useless to protest my opinion of such societies has always been well known and i supposed understood it pains me deeply to find that it has been disregarded young ladies your club is no longer in existence we will now return to our usual recreations in the library in this manner the k q c came to an end after the first shock of disappointment and chagrin after the first indignation had subsided even anne was constrained to acknowledge that the club had not been altogether a success the summary manner in which members were dismissed had always caused ill feeling there was a certain discrepancy between the rule that insisted upon kind feeling and the avoidance of gossip the keep quiet rule and that which permitted a secret committee to dispense arbitrary punishment certainly very few of the members had refrained from talking during the troubles of this winter and yet the secret committee had been on the point of dismissing only bertha macy and julia clark and allowing everyone else to retain membership anne at last admitted to dolly that there was something to be said on both sides this was some time after miss wickersham's decisive action however and when anne's indignation over dolly for what she at first had termed her outrageous interference had had time to abate there is no denying that she was very angry with dolly when she first heard it for of course dolly confessed the whole thing to her that very night end of chapter eighteen recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter nineteen of the friendship of anne a story by ellen douglas deland this librivox recording is in the public domain during all the troubles and exciting affairs sydney stuart had continued her visits to the little lady in the next house mrs braithwaite soon grew to be very dependent upon her and sydney was quite fascinated by the inconsequent yet charming ways of the blind woman there was something odd and baffling about her that piqued one's curiosity and the combination of gaiety and extreme sadness in her temperament made her attractive to sydney who although so young already found human nature the most interesting study in the world she was unconscious of this herself as yet but it was the case she was always hoping that mrs braithwaite would tell her the story of her life as she had promised to do but as yet nothing had been said mrs braithwaite played to her walked with her in the garden when the weather permitted or talked to her on many subjects in her beautiful sitting-room but that of her sorrow had not been touched upon the old servant eliza after sydney's first call appeared to approve of her mistress's new friend it relieved her of much responsibility 
and gave her more time for her other duties so eliza permitted the intercourse to continue there was no doubt that it was she who ruled the household mistress and servants alike there was another maid also of mature years and the old man who worked on the place there might have been a whole retinue of men and maids so far as mrs braithwaite's means were concerned but eliza preferred that there should be no more the winter wore away and then one day it seemed as though spring had really come although patches of snow still lay upon field and hill the ground had softened and the oozy mud of the roads showed that the frost was at last melting which had held them stiff and hard so long the breeze which blew gently from the south had a spring mildness in its breath and a bluebird was seen to perch and flit and perch again in mrs braithwaite's garden she was walking there leaning upon sydney's arm at the time hark she said in a breathless way is not that a bluebird and then sydney saw it and told her she was right i thought so she said softly my dear boy would have been the first to discover it he loved to see the first bluebird i have never told you about my boy have i sydney no miss braithwaite and i have always hoped you would was he your son oh no my grandson my only daughter's only child i never had a son of my own and perhaps for that very reason i loved him more even than most grandsons are loved i am tired of walking now sydney please take me back to the house they turned their steps towards the house and sydney felt a keen pang of disappointment she had hoped that the little lady had been about to tell her the story nothing more was said until they reached the sitting-room upstairs can you stay with me a little longer asked mrs braithwaite her voice which could be almost youthfully joyous had lost its note of gaiety and was sad yes i needn't go for some time we are having a half holiday this afternoon and most of the girls have gone for a drive they hired the big barge and invited miss jeanie to go too that was nice and did you not care to go with them did you give up that pleasure to come see an old woman like me i wanted to come and besides i could not go to drive you see we haven't a great deal of money miss braithwaite and it is necessary for me to be very economical and talbot wanted me to go as her guest but i would not do that anne is very generous but i would rather not let her do so much for me she is always wanting to give me things and pay for me but i won't let her you are right said the little lady i am glad for my own sake that you were free to come to see me to-day but i am sorry you could not have had the drive she went to the piano and after a few random notes she began to play bits from the pastoral symphony do you hear them she asked do you hear all the sounds of spring and the great world of outdoors how my boy loved the spring presently she left the piano and went to her usual chair where are you my dear come and sit beside me and let me hold your hand and i will tell you about my boy sydney did as she was desired she was uncertain what to say so she only pressed the hand in silence the hand with the long delicate fingers which showed such marvellous strength upon the piano he came to me when his mother died said mrs braithwaite beginning at once to speak he was only a baby then his father had also died suddenly two weeks after my daughter's death my boy was barely a year old 
the arrangement was that he should live with me and be my adopted son as well as my grandchild but that he should spend four months of each year with his father's family who loved him too who did not love him but they were only his aunts and uncles there were no grandparents there so i had the greater right to him sydney he was my idol i loved him as i had never loved any one before which is saying much for i have an eager nature the nature which when it gives love gives in no stinted measure it has caused me suffering but it is the true way to love she ceased speaking for a few minutes and sydney dared not break the silence she scarcely moved except to stroke with extreme gentleness the fine old hand that lay within her own presently mrs braithwaite continued her story his whole childhood was a joy to me she said her voice had become stronger and its tone was reminiscent of her grandson's happy youth he was so dear and affectionate full of charm he was always sunny and bright everyone loved him from the time he was able to speak he won friends there was never there never was a child who had so many when he went to his father's people it was the same it was because he loved every one he had a quick temper but he never harbored an unkind thought it was over in a flash if anything went wrong in the briefest instant the clouds would pass by and the sun be shining again i could talk to you for hours about his beautiful nature but i must hurry on i want to tell you about the tragedy for there was a tragedy have you had a tragedy too in your life said sydney in a low voice we have had one too my dear there are many tragedies in many lives but they are not always known mine was and so was ours you shall tell me of yours some day perhaps we shall be able through sympathy to comfort each other as i said my boy went each year to visit his father's family and there he had a friend a dear and intimate friend of whom he was more fond than of any other he was a boy of about his own age and though i never saw him i grew to know him through my dear child and to love him too they played together when they were little and later they had other boyish sports they were very congenial one day they went out with their guns sydney made a sudden movement what was coming but in some way purely accidental as they were getting over a fence the other boy's gun went off and braith was instantly killed braith repeated sydney in a choked voice was your grandson's name braith yes he was always called that his name was braithwaite appleton sydney suddenly let go of the hand she had been holding could the blind lady have seen her she would have been startled by the expression of her young face such misery was in the eyes it happened in maryland continued mrs braithwaite near baltimore i have always felt so sorry for that boy we never blamed him even though he told us they had quarreled just before it happened we never blamed him in the least braith had a very quick temper and it was nothing but a sudden falling out that would have been forgotten directly i have never seen him though i have always wished to very much they told me he was heartbroken and very sensitive and nothing could comfort him i have always felt nothing but sorrow and sympathy for him for i knew how he loved braith i wish i could tell him so who was the boy asked sydney her 
voice might have been another's it was so unlike her own miss braithwaite quick to catch the significance of every tone turned towards her my dear she said you must not take it so to heart it is all over now no said sydney it is not all over the boy who did it still lives what is his name mrs braithwaite his name is stuart like your own i told you the name of stuart was of significance to me was it philip stuart yes philip my boy always spoke of him as phil i thought so said sydney very quietly he is my brother for an instant there was perfect silence in the room save for the crackling of a log upon the hearth outside some sparrows chattered in the ivy which grew over the house except for this it was very still everywhere again miss braithwaite turned towards sydney then with a sudden movement she rose to her feet and held out her arms oh my dear my dear she exclaimed her voice shook with the intensity of her emotion where is your brother send for him let me see him my dear boy's best friend the last one who saw him alive why has he kept away from me did he think that i could possibly blame him your brother and i have loved you from the first she had sydney in her arms now and was leaning against her they stood thus for several minutes presently mrs braithwaite became calmer i want you to write to your mother and brother at once my dear and have them come to me here they shall stay at the hotel for they will be more comfortable than in this old house but they must be my guests from the time they leave new york there i am tired i must lie down this is too wonderful why sydney child why did you never guess it my name might have told you my boy was named for his grandfather and it is not a usual name i never heard him called braithwaite said sydney trying hard to speak calmly he was always braith and i suppose that was his real name i was quite a little girl you know and it never occurred to me of course i knew it was appleton but you have never spoken of that name i see it is all perfectly natural but still it seems strange and i thought your family still lived in maryland and although i was struck by the name of stuart when i first met you when i heard you came from new york i thought no more about it for i know there are many stuarts my home was in boston before i came here and i never went to baltimore my blindness was coming on for a long time before my boy died and after that it became very much worse so i never left my home it has prevented my taking more active measures to find your brother but i have longed so to know him that i might tell him not to grieve so deeply and now i shall have the opportunity i can scarcely believe it she relapsed into silence and presently eliza came upstairs and then sydney went back to the school she had promised mrs braithwaite that she would write to her mother and post the letter that afternoon so that it might leave kingsbridge by the evening mail and she must lose no time fortunately as it was a half holiday there were no school duties to be thought of so she wrote the letter immediately and walked with it to the post office it seemed strange now that everything was so plain that this wonderful discovery had never been made before why had it suggested itself to no one sydney thought it over as she walked along the muddy road she said to herself 
that she must have mentioned Mrs. Braithwaite by name in her letters. Then it occurred to her that she always spoke of her as the little lady, the name by which all the girls knew her. Possibly she had never written that of Braithwaite. What would her mother say when she received her letter? What would Phil say? She hoped that he would consent to come. He was so morbid on this subject, and shrank so from contact with other people, especially those who were in any way connected with the sad story. If once he could meet Mrs. Braithwaite and see her sweet face and hear her gentle words, Sidney felt sure he would realize her sincerity, and perhaps in time he would become more natural. In the meantime, there was nothing to do but wait and hope for the best, and pray that all might be made right. She was walking slowly back, lost in these thoughts, when she became conscious of a quick footstep behind her, and then came a laughing greeting. So it is you, Miss Stewart. I thought so, but I couldn't be sure until I got up to you, and so I didn't dare shout. It might have been a proud and haughty lady whom I didn't know and who would have swept me off the earth with scorn because I spoke to her. Why, Mr. Tracy, where did you come from? For it was Alec Tracy with his valise in his hand and evidently just from the train. Cambridge, thank you. I had a chance to cut, and so I have run up to see my mother couldn't help it don't you know don't know what she will say of course she'll be awfully sad at seeing me oh of course laughed sydney who did not feel at all sad herself at seeing him i'm glad it happened to be you and none other continued alec for i want to tell you how glad i am you're the sister of murray stuart you know, I never found it out until I met old Murray at the Talbots' New Year's Eve. We were pretty good friends when he was at college, and we've all of us missed him and were sorry he had to leave. A sudden impulse moved Sydney to speak more freely than she would have done had she paused to consider. She and Alec were very good friends and she knew that he knew all their story, and that he had been present when it had been talked about at the Talbots. I have just found out the most wonderful, the strangest thing, she said. I can't help speaking of it, and as you know Murray so well, you seem like an old friend, Mr. Tracy. Of course I'm an old friend, and I so wish you wouldn't, be so mighty particular to say mr tracy returned him promptly but what have you found out that mrs braithwaite is the grandmother of braith appleton the boy the boy you know i know said alec his voice full of sympathy well that is queer how did you find it out Sidney told him the circumstances, and he listened with deep attention. It is a mighty good thing, he said, when she had finished. I believe it will make all the difference in the world to Phil, to find she feels that way about him. He must be especially sensitive, and so it has made him more morbid than it would a good many other fellows. I am awfully glad about this may i tell my mother what you have told me she would be so interested and she knows all about your family you know sydney willingly consented and by the time she reached the school she felt better for having had this friendly talk it did not occur to her that alec had come considerably out of his way in order to accompany her she was only very glad that the world had become so full of friends. She told Elsie of what had occurred next door, 
It was easier now to talk about Phil's trouble than it once had been, and Elsie already knew the story. Anne and Dolly were told also, but to no one else did she speak of it, and they were asked to say nothing about it. That very evening came a note from Mrs. Tracy, full of kindness, and telling Sydney that she hoped very much that Mrs. Stewart and Philip would stay with her during their visit to Kingsbridge. The Kingsbridge Hotel is a poor place, we all know, and your family seem like old friends to me, my dear, not only for your own sake, but because my cousins Mrs. Talbot and Mrs. Dana have known your mother so long. Please send me your mother's address by the bearer of this, and I will write to her, begging her to give me the pleasure of a visit for as long as she wishes to stay. All this made Sydney very happy, but at the same time she felt anxious. How would Phil take it? He was so unlike other boys. Could he be convinced that Mrs. Braithwaite really did not blame him? Had this discovery been made in time to effect a cure, or was it too late? Phil was seventeen, and for four years he had brooded over his strange sorrow. His family had never been able to rouse him from it. His nature, once so sweet and loving, had become warped. It might be hopelessly warped. Only time would show what effect the meeting with Miss Braithwaite might have upon him. End of chapter 19 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 20 of The Friendship of Anne A Story by Ellen Douglas DeLand this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sydney went in to see Mrs. Braithwaite the next day. She found the little lady in a state of restless impatience. Have you written? she asked. Yes, Miss Braithwaite. The letter went yesterday. I think mother must have it now. And will they start today? I hardly think they will do that. You know, this is Saturday, and they will have to make plans and get ready. I think they will come the beginning of the week. Oh, they must, they must. I might die before I see him. There is no knowing. I am old now, you know, very old. Oh, how I long to clasp that poor boy to my heart and tell him not to grieve, and to tell him that already I love him and have loved him for years, because he was my boy's friend. Why, when Braith would come home after his visits in Maryland, he could talk of nothing but Phil, and what he had been doing with Phil, and what a friend he was. They used to write to each other. Yes, I know, said Sidney. It was so funny to see Phil writing to him. He hated writing letters, but he always answered those he got from Braith. But Mrs. Braithwaite, you must not expect him to get over his trouble at once, even though you are so ready to have him come. Phil has been almost morbid over this, and he has a strange nature now. He isn't like other boys any more. My dear, said the little lady, do not be troubled. Our Heavenly Father has some wise purpose in bringing your brother to me at last, and he has a wise purpose in letting him suffer first. I have great faith, Sidney. I have had much sorrow, but I have also much faith. The love we have for our fellow beings is a part of heavenly love. It is, in fact, the same thing. I think the power to love which God has given me was given for some purpose. I will love your poor brother, and he will feel 
that he is able to help a poor old blind woman who was the grandmother of his friend it will all work together for good sydney of that i am perfectly sure and during the sunday which intervened before she could hear from her mother sydney thought of these words more than once for strangely enough the sermon which she heard that day in church was preached from that text it strengthened her hope that philip might outlive her sorrow and be a nobler stronger man because of the suffering of his boyhood monday is always the hardest day in school said anne talbot indignantly somehow the lessons on monday are especially difficult i know they are longer by actual count the lessons for monday are at least two pages longer than those for other days it is very evident that the teachers take advantage of the holiday we have saturday to measure off an extra length of learning as if holidays ought to be used up on study anyway she was very indignant she and dorothy were dressing for breakfast this monday morning when she thus opened the conversation and as if everybody didn't know that it is especially hard to settle down to work again when you have had a few hours off when i keep a school things will be different and you can all send your children to it in perfect confidence that things will be made as easy for them as possible they shall never be forced to do a thing they don't want to and lessons will be only an amusement and joy fancy you keeping school laughed dolly shall you do your hair like dear wicky and talk alphabetically at supper no indeed the alphabet shall be banished from school altogether the children shall be taught to spell words the way they sound it is much more sensible and as for talking why we'll all talk about any old thing just as it comes up and we'll have meringues and ice cream and chocolate eclairs every day that will be a school worth going to dolly with an abrupt change of subject you think you're a very wise little person don't you why i didn't know i did oh yes you do you thought you were going to make everything straight by your wonderful visit to miss abby and your talks with bertha now you see you haven't i shan't say anything more about the untimely death of the k q c my injured feelings are too deep for words if it had been anybody but you who went to miss abby i should simply never have spoken to you again but somehow it is impossible to stay mad with you but you haven't done any real good you can't change a person like bertha macy we have found out what she is and you may depend upon it she will always be like that it isn't in her to be nice or honorable or kind don't you notice how hateful she still is to sydney nothing will ever make her different it won't if we all turn against her said dolly of course if we are going to make up our minds to have nothing more to do with her and scarcely speak to her and sort of point her out as a kind of a criminal she will probably go on being worse and worse it can't be possible that you would have us all treat her as if she hadn't done anything out of the way never let her know we are not used to that kind of doings just let her go on making mischief and trouble as long as she likes no of course not but now that we have shown her we don't like that sort of thing it seems mean not to help her again if she wants to be helped of course if she doesn't that is another matter if i don't 
know how to express it exactly, but it seems to me you have got to show a person that you trust them a little, or else they will feel awfully discouraged and not try a bit to do or to be anything worth trusting. And you have got to help them. Oh, Dolly, Dolly, groaned Anne. You're too much for one. I can't follow the lofty flights of your charity. I'm too much of an everyday person. If Bertha were very poor and hungry and all that, I would willingly give her all the money I could scrape together. But as she isn't, I don't want to have anything more to do with her, for I think she is dishonorable, and she isn't a lady. And I think, maintained Dolly stoutly, that giving money isn't everything. If by being friendly and encouraging, you can make a person feel that somebody is still willing to have something to do with them and would like to help them to be nicer, if you can make the person understand that, I think it is doing a great deal more for them than it would to put money in their pockets. And besides, Bertha Macy doesn't need money, but she does need some kind of friendly help. She looks awfully. I think she is very unhappy, and I am just as sorry for her as I can be. There is the breakfast bell. Oh, Anne, I am not half ready. Well, I am. The moral of it is, don't give lectures on charity while you are dressing for breakfast. You little provoking saint. You maddening little angel. Anne helped to finish her toilet, and the result was that they were both late, but not so late as Dolly would have been had she been left alone, and in spite of Anne's jeers and vehemence on the other side of the question, Dolly hoped that her words had made some slight impression. It was very hard to measure one's success in an argument with Anne. She usually protested until the last moment, and would then capitulate in the most unexpected manner, but with a thoroughness that left nothing to be desired. That Monday morning seemed especially long to Sydney. She knew that there must be a letter from her mother in the morning's mail, but as usual this was not distributed as soon as it was received so it was not until the noon recess that her suspense came to an end. The letter was then given to her, and she ran up to her room to read it, where she knew she would be safe from interruption. It was short, but it told her all she wished to know. Mrs. Stewart and Philip would take the morning train on Tuesday, arriving at Kingsbridge at five o'clock that afternoon. Sydney would meet them at the station and go with them to the hotel and would spend the evening with them either there or at Braithwaite Hall. She could tell them when they had arrived what it would be best to do. It might be unwise for Mrs. Braithwaite to see them that night. I have written to Miss Wickersham, wrote Mrs. Stewart, asking permission for you to be with us as much as possible while we are there, though, of course, I do not wish to interfere with your studies in any way. I told her that important family matters were bringing us. If she does not already know about it, I think it would be well for you to tell her. We must try to take it all as naturally as possible. I think I have made a mistake in that way in the past. Now that the opportunity for Phil to escape from his morbidness has come, we must do everything to encourage him to believe that his life has not been spoiled, and that he is not to consider himself forever to be different from other people. My dear child, it seems to me a wonderful thing that you should have gone to Kingsbridge to school and so have become acquainted with Mrs. Braithwaite. Truly we have much to be grateful for. Phil is very quiet about it, 
but I can see that it means a great deal to him. I hope, I venture to believe, my dear daughter, that the time is at hand when the heavy cloud that for so long has darkened our boy's life is about to be lifted, and you have helped to bring it about. There was nothing in the letter in regard to Mrs. Tracy's invitation, but Sydney remembered that she did not send the address in time for her mother to have received Mrs. Tracy's note before she wrote. To think that in about thirty hours her mother and brother would be in Kingsbridge. It was almost too wonderful to be believed. She wished that she might relieve Mrs. Braithwaite's anxiety, but she had no time then to run in next door to tell her that they were coming and get back for the opening of the afternoon session. For recess was now over. It was more difficult than ever to fix her attention upon her lessons after having received this letter, and, as the first was the hated arithmetic, poor Sydney had a hard time, and so did her teacher. The result of it was that she failed miserably and was informed that she must make up for her delinquencies by doing several extra examples before the next day you may choose your own time for them miss stewart said miss abby tartly for she was tired but i should advise you to stay in this afternoon until you have accomplished them there is no reason why you should not understand these rules perfectly we have been over them again and again and it seems to me incredible that a girl of your age and your usual good sense in other matters should exercise her reason so little in mathematics. You have behaved this morning precisely as though your mind were full of some other subject. Now there is no other subject that can possibly be of as much importance as the duty of the hour whatever it may be, and one of the most important branches of education is to learn to eliminate all unnecessary thoughts from the mind and concentrate our attention on the matter to be considered. Concentration, concentration, young ladies, it is that which I would inculcate. Elimination, concentration. Miss Abby's voice grew louder. She forgot that she had begun her remarks by a reproof for Sydney, and slipped into a general address which she had declaimed to all within hearing. The schoolroom was almost empty at the time, for there were classes in session in other rooms. Only the class in arithmetic was there to hear, and one or two girls who were occupied at their desks in other parts of the room. Bertha Macy was one of these. Therefore, Miss Stewart, continued Miss Abby, once more becoming personal, I would suggest that after dinner you return to your desk and devote yourself to mastering these simple examples. Return to her desk? When she had been counting upon going to see Mrs. Braithwaite, to tell her, her that her mother and brother were coming. It was most provoking, and the worst of it was that she felt perfectly sure that she should never understand these silly examples, which looked so easy at the first glance, but were really so full of pitfalls for the unwary. However, there was no help for it, though Miss Abby had put her words into the form of a suggestion, they were really meant for a command, and Sydney very well knew that the schoolroom would be inspected later to discover if she were at her desk, or if she should venture to go next door. Her movements would be observed, commented upon, and remembered. There was nothing to be done but return to the empty schoolroom always an especially dreary place in the afternoon 
because the thrusted windows face the east and devote herself to a task which she hated end of chapter twenty recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter number twenty one of the friendship of anne a story by ellen douglas deland this librivox recording is in the public domain she seated herself got out her book paper and pencil and began a is about to build a house he buys land which is taxed at thirty cents a foot which is at the rate of eight cents on the dollar what then does he pay for five acres of land if the owner wishes to sell it at an advance of three thousand dollars above its taxed valuation was there ever anything so puzzling thirty cents a foot it was thirty hours from twelve o'clock that day before her mother and phil should reach kingsbridge at what hour then would they arrive oh no it was not that a is about to build a house who is a and why on earth does he build a house on land so strangely sold who buys land by the foot she determined to multiply thirty by eight this accomplished she surveyed the result what should she do with the two hundred and forty and was it dollars or feet no it was cents two hundred and forty just about that many miles perhaps from kingsbridge to new york oh it would not do to think of that she would try the next example it was about b perhaps b's affairs would be more interesting and more sensible than those of a b is a horse car conductor he is obliged to punch a hole in a blue card for every fare or in a red card for every transfer fare received fares are five cents transfer seven at the end of the day he should hand in thirty seven dollars and nineteen cents of this seven tenths were fares the rest transfers how many punches of each kind had he made this was worse still what a miserable life that of a horse car conductor must be far worse than that of a pupil at wickersham school if at the end of his day's labor he must do a succession of such fearful problems as this there was no sense in it nor in any of these mathematical fictions sydney laid her head upon her arms which rested on the despised arithmetic there was no use in trying any more who cares what possible difference could it make how many fares that dreadful conductor collected when phil was coming to see mrs braithwaite and how impatient mrs braithwaite must be to hear when he was coming and she could not go to tell her because she was obliged to build houses and gather fares she had reached a very low state of mind when she became conscious that someone had entered the room and was standing looking at her she was aware of the steady gaze before she raised her head she found that it was bertha macy are you doing your arithmetic asked bertha her face was paler than usual and her eyes were red any girl but bertha macy would have been suspected of having cried a good deal but one never connected tears with bertha not that she was gay but because of a certain hardness that was habitual with her i'm trying to do it replied sydney in a depressed voice but i can't make head or tail of it it seems to me people in arithmetic do silly things i've given up two as hopeless now i am going to try the third it is a man named c who lays ties on a railroad there are so many ties to a mile and he does so many an hour 
he gets paid so much at the end of the day working at the rate of so many cents an hour how many ties had he laid and how much money did he make on each mile why i should be crazy if i were c her tone was so despairing that any one but bertha would have been amused i think i can help you said bertha if you will let me she added after an instant's pause i should be perfectly thankful if you would exclaimed sydney it is awfully good of you don't you want to be out no i don't care to go out to-day she did not say she had no one to walk with julia clark had gone with miss wickersham to see the doctor and none of the other girls had encouraged her to be with them dear me i wish i could go out i feel as if i must stay in for the rest of my life for i shall never be able to see through these horrors oh yes you will now this first one it isn't so bad as it looks you needn't think of that eight cents yet first find out how many feet there are in an acre see and for five acres well five times as much of course they worked in silence for a few minutes and then if he wanted three thousand more than the tax valuation you just add why bertha how easy is that really the answer but why do they ask it in such a queer way just to puzzle you they often set traps like that it is a very mean thing to do i think i never should have thought of this way of doing how clever you are this opinion was justified still further for bertha explained the others in a clear way and so on down the list she really proved herself to be an excellent teacher for her help consisted in setting forth the problem in clear language and then allowing sydney to work it out herself at the end of half an hour they had finished the task i do think you are very kind to help me said sydney gratefully i am ever and ever so much obliged to you you needn't be said bertha speaking in an abrupt way she did not look at sydney but was playing along with the charms on her watch chain i did you a lot of harm and i want to tell you i am sorry oh bertha you needn't say anything about that it is all over and things are coming out right at last well i am sorry i don't believe i ever should have told you so if it hadn't been for dolly fearing she has been nice to me but everybody else has has dropped me dolly said i ought to tell you of course i believed it was true what i said at aunt's party and of course i didn't know that was your brother there i thought his last name was murray she did not mention the anonymous letters and sydney did not remind her of them although she thought of them they had really done more harm than the speech at the talbots but that too was all a thing of the past now i am not coming back here to school next year said bertha i am going to a day school in new york i like the girls better there i know some of them and i don't think they are as changeable as some of the girls here i won't mention any names but you must know the one i mean you have found her so too but really i am sorry i made any trouble for you i don't think you ever liked me when we were rooming together and you didn't like me either bertha you know you didn't well perhaps i didn't but i think you are very kind to help me with these examples i wanted to i really did perhaps we shall like each other better now perhaps so and then they parted slowly the hours wore away night came and passed tuesday dawned and it also passed it was two o'clock three four would the last hour never go 
it seemed longer than any but that too dragged itself away and now it was time to go to the station to meet the travellers miss wickersham had been told the whole story and was willing to make everything easy for sydney miss abby when she heard it felt that there had been some reason for sydney's lack of concentration on the subject of arithmetic the day before and was rather more lenient in the class on tuesday miss jenny came to sydney's room and kissed her my dear she whispered i am so glad for you it was not surprising that the girls loved miss jenny she seemed more like a human being than did her automatic and austere sisters and often she was actually guilty of calling the pupils by their first names and when she did this their names sounded to them like a caress she was at the front door when sydney started on her walk to the station i am glad it is such a bright afternoon she said kingsbridge looks attractive on a day like this and we want your mother and brother to like it here you will not be back until nine i hear well sydney dear i am glad you are going to have an outing you are a good girl and deserve it such a good composition as that was you handed in friday you will hear something nice to-morrow this was delightful news to receive for the compositions were intended for a special test this time no doubt she would get honorable mention from what miss jenny said and that would be pleasant to happen while her mother was there so it was with a light heart that sydney set forth she glanced in as she passed the braithwaite place but no one was to be seen she had already run in there once before that day and had found the little lady perfectly composed but evidently awaiting philip's coming with great impatience she asked that they should come there that evening as soon as they should have finished supper primitive hours were still kept in kingsbridge and dinner was eaten in the middle of the day mrs stuart had declined mrs tracy's invitation feeling that it would be better for every reason for them to stay at the hotel so rooms had been engaged and they were to go there from the train and now sydney was at the station and there was yet ten minutes before the train was due it was a fine evening in april the day had been mild and the sun was setting in a clear west with scarcely a cloud to catch its glory the usual collection of vehicles was drawn up at the station platform and one or two persons had gathered to take the train which would presently start for boston and the intervening places kingsbridge was at the end of the branch road and the train which was due now would run immediately back to the junction sydney watched and waited and presently the shriek of a locomotive took her at that they were coming actually coming and then the train drew up and in a moment one of the dear familiar figures alighted it was philip and now he would turn to help the little mother but no he came straight towards sydney and he was smiling at her so nothing alarming could have happened but where was her mother mother couldn't come he said amabel has measles she is not very sick but mother couldn't leave i know you're awfully disappointed and so am i but sydney i wanted to tell you right off that that everything looks brighter it's all owing to you so this is kingsbridge is it funny little place it seems after new york but phil isn't mother coming at all oh i am so disappointed and are you sure amabel isn't very sick scarcely sick at all has it gotten bad the way we had them mother didn't think of its being measles until this morning and there was no time to let you know 
in spite of her disappointment about mother it was delightful to see phil and to see him in these unusual good spirits the expression of his face was different and so was the tone of his voice surely the shadow had already begun to lift they were walking towards the hotel when mrs tracy drove up to the post office just as they passed it and stopped she greeted sydney who drew phil towards the carriage and introduced him and mother hasn't come she said sadly and you are alone said mrs tracy that you must certainly come home with me i shall take no refusal before they realized quite what was happening they were seated in mrs tracy's carriage and were spinning towards the big house on high street it was certainly much more agreeable to be in this pleasant home than at the dismal little hotel and mrs tracy understanding boys perfectly even one who was unlike most boys soon seemed to philip like an old friend her sons being absent there was no one at dinner but the two stewards and herself philip was quiet but perfectly at ease neither his morbidness nor his recident nature had ever made him awkward or self-conscious on the contrary he appeared much older than his years and he carried himself with the grave dignity of a grown man who had already encountered some of the sorrows of life he was certainly very different from her own boys or their friends who came to stay there jolly rollicking fellows who were always ready for some kind of fun and who made the house ring with laughter and gaiety but mrs tracy liked him and felt a certain respect for him i am so glad i arrived just in time to catch you she said when they rose from the table it would have been forlorn for you and sydney to be at the hotel to-night without your mother and as for me i should have been entirely alone here so you have done me a kindness by coming i hope you will stay several days with me now don't say you cannot you must stay over to-morrow night anyway and then we can discuss your later plans mrs braithwaite will want to see you again so you certainly cannot leave to-morrow it is time for you to go there now for it will not do to keep her waiting no doubt she is sadly impatient to see you sydney would you rather drive or walk thomas can take you there if you wish the horses don't get half enough exercise but they preferred to walk it was a fine moonlight night and walking would be a pleasure it was decided that sydney should not return to mrs tracy's as it would be time to go back to the school when their call was over mrs tracy drew her aside i want to persuade your brother to stay over at least tomorrow night she whispered we'll have anne and some of the others to supper oh i should like to have him meet anne of course now make him stay and then the brother and sister set forth the moon was almost full a mist hung over the valley but one could see the winding river and the outlines of the hills beyond near at hand the trees threw black shadows across the road while the white houses of kingsbridge shone out in keen relief neither philip nor sydney spoke as they walked quickly along high street and then followed the moor country like road which lay past braithwaite hall and the wickersham school presently they turned in between the old stone gate posts and followed the curving avenue which led to the house sydney remembered the other moonlight night when she had gone on the quest commanded by the k q c what an odd thing that was to do and how had she ever had the temerity to enter another person's house in that manner this time there were lights in many parts of the house evidently it had been illuminated in their honor for never before had there been so many gleaming windows 
they rang the bell and almost immediately the door was opened by eliza walk upstairs if you please she said the mistress is waiting for you to sydney's keen ear her voice sounded more friendly than usual she glanced at phil as they stood for a moment in the dimly lighted hall while they removed their wraps his face had grown very pale and his hands were shaking sydney he whispered i don't feel as if i could see her i did it it was all my fault she can't forgive me it is impossible go right up phil said sydney calmly she was frightened however suppose phil should give out at the last minute and really refuse to go upstairs it would not be surprising she longed for her mother's presence more than ever no i cannot go up said phil again he actually began to put on the overcoat which he had just taken off phil this is nonsense said sydney drawing the coat away from him mrs braithwaite is waiting to see you you owe it to her it would be very selfish to run away now as well as cowardly remember she is old and blind and she has her heart set on having you come to her come right up don't wait a minute she put her hand in his arm and tried to pull him towards the stairs he yielded at last and they went up to the next floor sydney leading him he seemed scarcely able to see they walked to the door of the sitting-room and she knocked softly come said a voice within and she opened the door and then thrust philip in before her and closed it again a sudden thought told her it would be easier for him to enter alone and philip left alone regained his composure in an instant for what he saw banished his hesitation and renewed his courage the room as usual was brilliantly lighted standing at one end her face turned towards him and so full of feeling that even the sightless eyes were expressive was the little lady she was so very small and slight and fragile that in a figure she was like a girl her face was tender with anticipation and with the memory of her grandson her sorrows had marked it but her sweet spirit had turned the sorrow lines into those of a deep rare beauty is that phil at last she said my boy i have waited for you so long you were brace dearest friend the last one who was with him I am glad you have come to me after all these years. A little later Sydney, coming in quietly, found them sitting hand in hand, and Phil was telling Brace's grandmother of all that they used to do together in the old days on the shores of Chesapeake Bay. Sydney had never seen either face, the old or the young, so happy. Of a truth, the shadow had lifted. End of chapter 21 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C.